So these space-time theorems of general relativity are growing in number and growing in generality, and the theorems are becoming more and more applicable. And to quote a couple of astrophysicists, Ford and Roman, uh, they wrote in their paper that all reasonable cosmic models are subject to the relentless grip of the space-time theorems of general relativity. Now, they were in this paper talking about what they called the unreasonable models. These are models where the second law of thermodynamics does not operate. Uh, that second law tells us that uh, things will tend from order to disorder, and the heat will flow from hot bodies to cold bodies. Now, if you allow that second law to be violated, there are possible ways you can escape this ultimate beginning of matter, energy, space, and time. But we refer to them as unreasonable cosmic models because they will not allow any kind of physical life to exist. And clearly, physical life does exist uh, in the universe. Therefore, all the reasonable models, models that would permit the existence of physical life, indeed are subject uh, to these space-time theorems, which gives us a rigorous proof that there must be a causal agent beyond space and time as responsible for bringing into existence this universe of matter, energy, space, and time. Now, in creationist science, we refer to our reasons to believe creation model as a testable model that is able to make predictions of future scientific discoveries. Let me give you six such discoveries in the context of these space-time theorems. We would predict that the evidence for a single cosmic beginning, as opposed to multiple beginnings, will get stronger as astrophysicists learn more about the universe. That the evidence that time is finite rather than infinite, again, would increase. That evidence for general relativity reliably describing cosmic dynamics uh, will become even more spectacular than it is today. In fact, there's an experiment going on right now, the Gravity B probe, uh, to test the theory of general relativity in one arena where we've only been able to push it to two places, the decimal. Uh, this is the lens thuring effect. It's the weakest of the tests that have been performed so far. But the Gravity B probe uh, will give us 100 to 1,000 times more accuracy in putting general relativity to the test in that arena. We would predict that general relativity will continue to spectacularly uh, pass those tests. Uh, number four, uh, we would predict that the grip of the space-time theorems of general relativity will become even more relentless in the future than they are today. And the case for a transcendent causal agent will grow stronger and stronger as we learn more and more about the physics of the universe. And we would anticipate that evidence for other miraculous acts will be found. And what I want to emphasize here is that what we're confronted with is an undeniable miracle that has taken place. And it's the biggest we can imagine. I mean, if you were to ask me as a scientist, what's the biggest miracle have you ever seen? Uh, physically, I would have to say it's the creation of the universe out of that which we can't see or detect or measure. So this is the greatest of the scientific miracles that we've been able to document and prove. And the fact that we've been able to establish one miracle, uh, this great miracle, opens up the possibility that other miracles necessarily could have taken place, which means we can no longer do scientific research under the assumption that miracles never happen. We've been able to prove uh, in a very powerful way that at least one has taken place, and if one has happened, that opens up the possibility for others. And uh, therefore, we can't restrict science to being a discipline that only looks at strictly natural causes. The possibility for the supernatural has been proven uh, to be the case. Now, as much as the Bible says about the beginning of the universe, it actually says much more about the expansion of the universe. In the English translations, it usually comes out that God is stretching out the heavens. But the verb nata is actually better translated, the continuous expansion of the universe. Now, you won't find any of these statements in the book of Genesis, but once you get to Job and forward, you'll see six different Bible authors that speak explicitly about this continuous expansion of the universe. Job makes the point that there's something supernatural about this expansion. 
says God alone is expanding the universe in a manner that would permit life to exist. Isaiah and Psalms makes the point that God is expanding the universe like one would stretch out a tent in order to live in it. And the interesting thing about the word picture is the reality of a tent is its surface. Uh, it's not the interior or the exterior, but the surface that makes up that tent. Well, likewise, astronomers now know that the reality of the universe is a surface with nothing interior or exterior. And if I were to give you an analogy, think of planet Earth. Planet Earth is a three-dimensional body, but where do we human beings live? We live on the two-dimensional surface of the three-dimensional Earth. Likewise, astronomers have now demonstrated that all the stars and galaxies, all the matter and energy, is on the three-dimensional surface of the four-dimensional expanding universe, ignoring for a moment the six tiny space dimensions that accompany the four large dimensions. Now, only since 1999 have we been able to prove that there's something special about this expansion universe. Now, the expanding universe concept has been around for, from a scientific perspective ever since Albert Einstein developed his equations of general relativity. If you solve those equations, it predicts an expanding universe. And in the 1920s and 1930s, astronomers here in Southern California made measurements in the galaxies that showed that the galaxies are moving away from one another in a manner that can only be explained by a continuously expanding universe. But in 1999, astronomers discovered that there were two physical factors that moderated or governed this continual expansion universe. Now, one was gravity, and that's easy to understand. Uh, you know, there's two massive objects. The law of gravity tells us that they will attract one another. And the closer they are together, the more powerfully they will attract. And so with a continuous expanding universe, when the universe is young, it'll be small, the space surface will be small, the massive objects will be close together, and therefore gravity will be strong in its capacity to slow down the expansion of the universe. But as the universe gets older and older, and hence bigger and bigger, the bits and pieces of matter get stretched farther apart, and gravity becomes progressively weaker in its capacity to slow down the expansion of the universe. But in 1999, astronomers noted that for the first 8 billion years of its history, we observed the universe slowing down in its expansion, but for the last 6 billion years, it's speeding up and that told them that there had to be this uh, property of the space surface of the universe that is now called dark energy. And dark energy has been called an anti-gravity term for the universe. That's really not correct. It's much more accurate to refer to it as an anti-elastic band. Now, I've got an elastic band here in front of me. Notice that it has a property that the more I stretch it, the more energy it gains to force contraction. The surface of the universe is the opposite. The more you stretch the surface of the universe, the more energy it gains to force forward even more rapid expansion of the universe. And you get the opposite effect of gravity. R namely, that when the universe is young, the surface is small, and therefore dark energy is weak in its capacity to stretch out the universe. But as the universe gets older and older, the surface gets bigger and bigger, and hence gains more and more energy to accelerate the expansion of the universe. Now, a number of years ago, uh, Lawrence Krauss, uh, chairman of the Physics and Astronomy Department at Case Western Univer Reserve University, published this paper in the Astrophysical Journal, in which he stated, and this is a direct quote, that dark energy would involve the most extreme fine-tuning problem known in physics. And uh, he goes on in this paper to explain the nature of the problem. And it's not a difficult concept. If the universe expands too rapidly from the creation event, that will force the bits and pieces of matter away from one another at such high velocities that gravity will never have the strength to pull any of that matter into clumps to make galaxies, stars, and planets. And if the universe has no galaxies, stars, and planets, there'll be no home in which life can possibly exist. 
On the other hand, if you expand the universe too slowly from the creation event, then gravity will e efficiently collect that matter, clump that matter into dense bodies. Uh, we're talking black holes and neutron stars. In other words, all the matter of the universe in a relatively short period of time uh, would be collected into these black holes and neutron stars. Now, the minimum density of a black hole or a neutron star is 5 billion tons per level teaspoonful.